This also affects our understanding of sacramental sacrifice today. Jesus gave his life for us 2,000 years ago on Calvary. He died that we might live. He shed his blood once for all. Heb 727, 912. But the Orthodox and Catholics believe that he is present and gives his life sacramentally or through sacred mystery, extended and repeated in an unbloody sacrifice every day in the Eucharist. The early church and even the first Protestant reformers believed in the real presence and sacrifice as well, though they theologically adapted it in various ways. Jesus is fully present in the Eucharist in a way that is frankly beyond our understanding. This means that sacramentally, Jesus is timelessly giving his very life for us daily and at every moment. The reality of his final sacrifice on Calvary is brought into the present moment at every Eucharist. This is most powerful for the one who understands it. The real presence and sacrifice of Jesus are brought right into our daily experience as a sacramental act, not as a mere theology from the past. There is simply no way to meditate on this reality and not be filled with tearful gratitude for Jesus giving his life for us. If we understand this, there is simply no way to receive communion without being overwhelmed as well. Salvation becomes an immediate reality that reduces us to tears and lifts us up to joy. I find the Eucharist a powerful way to experience daily the sacrifice of Jesus for me personally. This happens not through mere theology or intellectual understanding. It occurs in a simple sacramental act of the Logos, which is beyond human words. It is an action that reduces me to sacred stillness, Hasekia. Do we allow ourselves to sink into the mystery of salvation? Or do we skim across the surface of the waters of salvation with a mere intellectual understanding? Jesus is our Savior. How can we but not weep tears of gratitude, repentance, and pure joy when we meditate on Him? Every time we pray the Jesus Prayer, we enter into the daily reality of our salvation in the Savior in a way that lies beyond words. It must be a prayer. It must be breathed. It must be in, in the Spirit of Jesus, our Savior and author of our personal salvation. As we breathe in, let's allow the salvation that only Jesus can bring to fill us up. Allow it to be personal and intimate. We breathe in the reality of Jesus' personal sacrifice for me, personally. Allow this sacrifice to be personal and now, not a mere theological idea from the past, but now. Jesus loves you enough to give his life for you out of complete self-emptying love. We allow Jesus to transform us moment by moment with each breath we breathe. The next word in the Jesus prayer is Christ, which means anointed. It comes from the Greek Christos. It was used for the Messiah and applied to Jesus as the anointed one, Christ. As followers of Jesus, we are called Christians. This comes from Acts 11:26, where this name was given to followers of Jesus in Antioch by others outside of the faith, and 1 Peter 4:16, where it is related to both self-identity and enduring sufferings with Christ. Some have said that it means like Christ. We are to be anointed like Christ. The word for anointed here is the Greek creo, which is probably akin to kreomai, meaning to make ready for use through being rubbed or smeared with oil, or to be consecrated to an office or religious service. It is used to consecrate Jesus to the messianic office, furnishing him with the necessary powers to give Christians the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Our anointing is not a rite as it is for the incarnate Logos, Word, the second person of the Trinity, but is a gift bestowed on us as the adopted sons and daughters of God in Christ, Rom 8.15. Our anointing comes from and leads back to Christ Jesus. I came back to Christ through the Jesus movement, albeit through a side door of interfaith studies. The Jesus movement was largely Pentecostal and charismatic, so when I became a Catholic, I naturally sought out the Catholic charismatic renewal. I also encountered the Evangelical Orthodox Church in Indianapolis, a charismatic expression of the Orthodox tradition, using the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in their worship. Though rather hidden in small groups in most parishes in America at that time, Catholic charismatics still constituted the largest single united body of charismatics in the world. I found them everywhere. I also recall Father Paulson at the old Charismatic Center in Houston asking me to play at a Mass during my Jesus music days. I replied that I didn't even know what a Mass was. He said in a unique Texas drawl, You love Jesus, don't you? I said yes. 
so he warmly welcomed me as a brother in Christ and allowed me to play at the preparation of the gifts after the intercessions and before the formal liturgy of the Eucharist, though I was not yet a Catholic or ready to receive the Eucharist at that stage in my spiritual journey. His kindness stays with me to this day. The Spirit had been poured forth on the early church at Pentecost, but in a way that brought forth radical change for the better in their lives as a renewed community. The Spirit is the power of Jesus that made him more than a typical religious founder or a good religious idea. Through the Spirit, we have a personal encounter with the full incarnation of God in Christ, Acts 2. Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Locate 24, 49. The Greek word for power is dynamis, which is the origin of our word dynamite. But dynamite can be used for good or ill, for example, blowing up bank vaults or clearing away rock for highways. So St. Paul had to write to correct the abuses of that power by the Corinthians. Hesychasm, meaning sacred stillness, an ancient practice of hermits in the Eastern Church, focuses on the actual experience of the Spirit of God. One hesychast was St. Seraphim of Sarov, 1754 or 1759, 1833, sometimes called the St. Francis of Russia, who became well known through the book The Acquisition of the Holy Spirit. It records the following interaction. Then Father Seraphim gripped me firmly by the shoulders and said, My friend, both of us at this moment are in the Holy Spirit, you and I. Why won't you look at me? I can't look at you, Father, because the light flashing from your eyes and face is brighter than the sun and I'm dazzled. Don't be afraid, friend of God. You yourself are shining just like I am. You too are now in the fullness of grace of the Holy Spirit, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see me as you do. Hesychasts, like St. Gregory Palamas, 1296-1359, differentiated between the uncreated energies and the essence of God. The phenomenon of the Spirit, or any knowable aspect of God in the phenomenal world, is part of God's uncreated energies, which emanate from Him. In contrast, God's essence is part of God's transcendence, and so is beyond human perception through any knowable faculty. At best, the essence of God can be intuited in contemplative union that is sometimes called unknowing. The Hesychasts were criticized not for their belief in the essence of God, but for their experiences of the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. Ever since the Montanist heresy of the second century, the entire church had been rather leery of trusting in charismatic gifts. Indeed, the Montanists trusted in the gifts over the apostolic authority of the bishops, and this ended up in schism and heresy. Ironically, the Hesychasts, who were known for sacred stillness and contemplation, had to verbally defend their position on their experience of the supernatural phenomenon. In his famous 14th century answer to Barlam of Calabria, a Westerner who taught that God is transcendent beyond any human experiences, St. Gregory Palamas used his explanation of God's knowable, uncreated energies to defend the Hesychasts. Until recently, the West has continued to resist this teaching on Western patristic grounds. But this has changed, particularly since John Paul II praised Hesychasm and the Christian East for its mystical heights. The phenomenon the Hesychasts experienced was called Taboric Light, also uncreated light and divine light. It is the light experienced by Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, traditionally held to be Mount Tabor in Lower Galilee of the Holy Land. Here, Jesus was transfigured with light, conversed with Moses and Elijah about his passion and glorification, and is overshadowed by a cloud, during which a voice said, This is my beloved Son, hear him. These were all perceptible by the apostles, but were clearly outside of the natural phenomenon of ordinary existence. When the cloud subsided, Jesus was found alone. Such phenomenon are considered uncreated energies. They are part of the spiritual journey to a contemplative place, complete intuitive communion, beyond understanding or description. It simply must be experienced to be understood. So the phenomenon of the gift of the Spirit has been controversial to say the least. Catholics and evangelicals took quite a bit of time to accept the charismatic renewal, and some still do not. But under various names, these phenomenon have accompanied the saints of the East and the West throughout our history. 
The dialogue between the Christian East and West continues regarding hesychasm, but great headway is being made on a popular and even a theological level. The greatest test of the authenticity of all such phenomenon of the Spirit is always seen in whether they make us more like Jesus or lead us to delusion through pride. A great way to ensure that we are really anointed is to transfer the meaning of Christian, or like Christ, to like Jesus. In other words, put some flesh and blood on the anointing. Let the anointing of the Spirit be incarnational, just as Jesus was the incarnate Word. What does it mean to be anointed by the Spirit like Jesus? A few key scriptures point the way. The Sermon on the Mount, 1 Corinthians 13, the Fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22, and the Great Canticle of Self-Emptying Love, Philippians 2, 5, 11. God is love, 1 Gn 4, 8, and love fulfills the law of God. St. Augustine, the great theologian of divine love, said, Love and do what you will. But what is love? There are three Greek words for love, the social or unconditional agape, agapao, the affection of friendship in filio, filio, and the passion of eros, eros. The first two are primarily found in the New Testament, but all three were used in the early church. While often relegated to an inferior kind of love, eros can be the positive, passionate lifting of ourselves above ourselves by loving. Pope Benedict XVI relates the gift of all three in his encyclical God is Love. The main characteristic of all three forms of love is self-giving or self-emptying for the sake of another. The greatest other is God and neighbor. St. Paul also writes rapturously of love in the great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. He says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. Greek, literally, seek itself. It is not quick-tempered. Love never fails. This description could well apply to Jesus. In the early days of the Jesus movement, we were encouraged to substitute the name of Jesus for love. If we are like Jesus, we can put our name there as well. Such a meditation will surely begin to change us, moving us from the mind of meditation to the emotions and actions of our entire life. It will help us become more like Christ. We know that the fruit of the Spirit is similar. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma, meaning air, wind, and breath. It can apply to both the Holy Spirit and the human spirit. The fruit of the Spirit has been translated both ways, for both bring forth good fruit when they are the primary mode of operation in our lives if we are operating in the Spirit of God. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Galatians lists them as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. Arnab. Who does not want to live like this? It is the deepest desire of every human being, whether we are aware of it or not. As Augustine said, my heart is restless until it rests in you. We all want the victory of love over hate, joy over sorrow and despair, peace over conflict and war, patience over impatience, kindness over cruelty, generosity over consumerism, faithfulness over destructive doubt, gentleness over arrogance and pride, and self-control over unbridled promiscuity. Jesus shows us the way to such beauty that every human heart longs for. But Paul's description also shows us the mechanics of how to get there. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passion. If we live by the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. This is a mouthful, but it is not complicated. The way to the release of the Spirit of God and the rebirth of our deepest spirit and truest self is through the dying and rising of Jesus, not just as an idea, but also as an experience. The Jesus prayer is one prayer aid that will actually get us there. The last scripture that reveals to us the character of being like Jesus is St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. In chapter 2 he says, Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, 
God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the scripture describing better than any other the self-emptying or kenosis from the Greek kenos, meaning to empty oneself completely, of Jesus. This is found in the incarnation of the divine Logos as a human being, the second person of the Trinity, who is eternally begotten from the Father in the Godhead. But it reaches its climax in the mystery of mysteries, the Paschal mystery of the cross. Only because of this did God the Father give him the name above every name and a glory above all others. We can now share in this mystery as we become like Jesus Christ as Christians and Catholics. We can share in the Catholicos of being abundantly and universally filled with the anointing of Jesus Christ. It is what we all hunger for. It is only when we experience this that we will find the love, joy, and peace of the Spirit that only the Spirit of God can bring through dying and rising to our old selves once and for all. It is interesting that the city where the name Christian was first used was also the city of St. Ignatius of Antioch, first century, who first used the word Catholic, Catholicos in Greek, which means universal and full, and has both ecclesial and personal ramifications. It addresses church structure and personal piety. Later, we will look to the more personal and ecumenical aspects, but a few more ecclesial sources will help us to understand how important proper church life was to the early Hesychasts. In his letter to the Smyrnians, Ignatius says, Wherever the bishop appears, there let the people be. As wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. It is not lawful to baptize or give communion without the consent of the bishop. St. Vincent of Larens, on a monastic island off the southern coast of Gaul, wrote in 434 a work known as the Commonatoria. In it, he addressed a question that some were asking about the authority of the Church. Since the canon of Scripture is complete, and sufficient of itself for everything, and more than sufficient, what need is there to join with it the authority of the Church's interpretation? For this reason, because, owing to the depth of Holy Scripture, all do not accept it in one and the same sense, but one understands its words in one way, another in another. Therefore, it is very necessary, on account of so great intricacies of such various error, that the rule for the right understanding of the prophets and apostles should be framed in accordance with the standard of ecclesiastical and Catholic interpretation. While he insisted that, like the human body, church doctrine develops while truly keeping its identity, St. Vincent further declared that in the Catholic Church, we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always by all. For that is truly and in the strictest sense, Catholic. This statement has become a standard description of the Catholic faith. Of course, this must be nuanced by Vincent's other notion of development of doctrine that was expounded and expanded so beautifully with the great John Henry Newman, 1801-1890, in Britain. St. Vincent wrote, But someone will say, perhaps, Shall there then be no progress in Christ's church? Certainly, all possible progress. Yet on condition that it be real progress, not alteration of the faith. Development of doctrine is not some lifeless concept, but based on the reality of life itself. It maintains that the acorn and the oak are essentially the same tree, but only seen at different stages of growth. Likewise, a stream takes on many different appearances as it faces different obstacles and landscapes at different stages of its journey to the sea, but it is essentially the same water throughout. The same is true of doctrine. The Incarnation, the Trinity, the Eucharist and all truths remain constant, but our understanding develops as we face various obstacles and questions at various stages of the growth of the Church in history. This is a life-giving principle. Scripture itself teaches us that we are living stones in a spiritual temple, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. Hey guys, it's Brent. Thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe and like this video.